In the fall of 1994, Michael Cremo, co-author with Richard Thompson of the highly controversial book, The Hidden History of the Human Race, embarked on a three-month nationwide television and radio tour to publicize their work. At the same time, a highly rated nationwide television program was aired dealing directly with the theme of their book. In the last 150 years, a mass of scientific evidence proving that people like ourselves existed millions of years ago has been systematically suppressed by the scientific establishment. The following are excerpts from these shows viewed or heard by more than 20 million people. Why would thousands of artifacts be ignored by mainstream archaeology? They show the unthinkable. Images of man battling with dinosaurs. Reptilian creatures interacting with men and women. Ancient inscriptions on stones depicting complex surgical procedures. And carved metallic spheres found in rock strata 2.8 billion years old. This evidence points to one conclusion, that the history of life on this planet may be radically different than what is accepted today. In this program, The Forbidden History of Man, we will examine documented evidence which suggests that our theory of evolution needs to be completely revised. Much of this evidence has been known for hundreds of years, but it's been ignored because it directly contradicts theories which are universally accepted. We will hear reports from a new breed of scientists who have been labeled heretics for daring to challenge fundamental scientific theories. In their controversial book, Forbidden Archaeology, Michael Cremo and Dr. Richard Thompson have revealed a major scientific cover-up. Since the beginning of archaeology, researchers have found bones and artifacts showing humans like us existed hundreds of millions of years ago. But according to Thompson, these discoveries have been suppressed, and we have come to accept a picture of prehistory that is largely incorrect. Thompson and Cremo have documented hundreds of cases which tell a gripping story of a scientific world shrouded in conspiracy and deception. And welcome back to 43 Focus, and please welcome Michael Cremo, who is the co-author of this book, The Hidden History of the Human Race. Nice to see you, Michael. Good to be here, Gary. This, um, I believe, calls into question Darwinian's theory of evolution. Is well, that correct? Y yes, Gary. Essentially, that theory says that human beings like us have been around for about 100,000 years. And before that, you would have had only ape-man-like creatures. Before that, apes and monkeys. Uh, what we found, however, when we looked into the entire history of archaeology, uh, my co-author and I did eight years of research. We looked at every archaeological discovery that's ever been made and what we found is that there are hundreds of such discoveries that indicate human beings like ourselves have mm -hmm. been around for literally millions of years. What's been the reception to this to this book? Oh, there's been from the uh, spokespersons of the scientific establishment there has been absolute outrage. Um, you know, for example, you know, How dare you well, come yeah. up with any kind well, of a... Well, like Richard Leakey, for example, he said this book is you know, pure humbug, nobody would take it seriously but a fool. Uh, on the other hand, we've had uh, many uh, scientists and scholars uh, say this is a wonderful book. It's really, gr really great that finally somebody has brought together all this evidence because a lot of it's not available in English. You know, we had to do eight years of research, translate papers from German, you, Russian. You, you referred to, in India, the Vedic literature? Well, what, yes. What I, I was saying uh, in the beginning that we do take uh, uh, our inspiration from these uh, ancient Sanskrit writings of India. Uh, they're collectively called the Vedas. Among them are the Puranas. Purana is a Sanskrit word. It means history. Now, these histories tell of human civilizations on this planet going back millions of years. How do, now, we we know thought, those are, how do we know those are accurate? Well, that was our question, too. Uh, Richard Thompson and I, we thought, well, if 
if there's any accuracy to, to those statements, there, there must be some factual evidence to back them up. Now, when we looked in the current textbooks, of course, we didn't find any such evidence, but we thought, well, let's look a little bit uh, further. And as I said, that led to an eight-year research program where we investigated every archaeological discovery ever made. And what we found is, is that Practically speaking, archaeologists and anthropologists have buried almost as much evidence as they've dug up. In other or words... Or perhaps overlooked, um, cast aside? Well, yes, cast aside. Uh, and, and, and there have been some outright cases of, um, of uh, suppression where people who have reported such things have had their careers ruined. We should never, I don't think, be afraid to investigate opposing points of view and the hidden yes. history of, of the human race uh, is something that uh, is in direct opposition I guess to the Darwinian theory it of, of, is, of yes. evolution this um, this human person who looked like us existed mm -hmm. millions of years ago did not evolve from an ape uh, as we are led to believe in the Darwin theory why has this evidence been suppressed, and what kind of evidence have you found to support this? Well, I'll give you a very good example. Now, one example from historical times is during the California Gold Rush days, miners were digging tunnels thousands of feet into the sides of mountains. Now, the, the rock in these mountains is over 10 million years old. So when they were digging these tunnels, they were finding human skeletons, they were finding stone spear points, they were finding mortars and pestles, hundreds of them at dozens of locations. Now, all these were gathered together, reported to the scientific world by J.D. Whitney, who was the state geologist of California. And he published a massive book about them uh, by Harvard University. Harvard University was the publisher. Now, what happened to these artifacts? Why aren't they on display in museums? Why aren't our children taught about them in schools? There was a very powerful anthropologist at the Smithsonian Institution named William H. Holmes. And he said to Whitney, you, Dr. Whitney, if you had understood the theory of human evolution as we understand it today, you would have hesitated to announce your conclusion, namely that human beings existed millions of years ago, despite the imposing array of facts with which you were confronted. In other words, simply because the facts didn't fit the theory, the facts had to go, and so did Professor Whitney. How, but, but back then I would imagine that they did not have the um, scientific uh, procedures to identify the exact age of, of uh, bones and matter that we have today. So can you be confident that this researcher was able to give um, a time for these bones? Yes. That were found? We checked with the modern geologist about the age of the, the deposits. Mm -hmm. Now, these things continue to be discovered today, for example. And a vast amount of evidence showing that human beings like ourselves have been around for millions of years has been systematically suppressed. And I can give you some examples. Okay. For example, in 1979, Mary Leakey, who's one of the most famous archaeologists of this century, discovered in Africa completely modern human footprints, no different from the footprints that you or I would make on a beach today. Now, the thing about these footprints is they were found in rock that was dated 3.6 million years old. And that throws out completely any idea of human origins that's current today. Why would anyone want information like that suppressed? Mm -hmm. What possible advantage would there be in that? Well, power, prestige, money, there's a lot riding on it. Uh, if any if even one of the hundreds of cases that we document in the hidden history of the human race were found to be true, accepted, that would mean that everything we've been told about human origins and antiquity for the past 150 years is simply not true. And I don't think that the current establishment is ready to admit that. How long ago do you think that, that this evidence was suppressed? I mean, is this something that's been going on for, for years and years? Yes, this has been going on for about 150 years. I'll give you another example. In the eight
following what it is that you have uncovered from other people's findings in this type of thing, do you believe that man existed with the dinosaur, for example, to, to, to give people a general mm -hmm. idea of how to pinpoint Right. That's a very good question, Michelle. And from the evidence that we've uncovered, we have some very good reports of a human presence even before you know, the time of the dinosaurs. For example, in the 1840s, there was a, a, a scientific magazine called The Geologist, and it reported that in Macoupin County, Illinois, which is right here in North America, in the United States, uh, a human skeleton, just like ours, had been uncovered in a coal mine, in solid coal, 90 feet deep underneath the ground. Now, Richard Thompson and I were able to discover from the reports exactly where that occurred. And we talked to the uh, Geological Survey of the state of Illinois, and we asked them, well, how old is the coal there? And it turned out it was 300 million years old, which means it's mm -hmm. older than the Jurassic, you know, that word right. that everybody knows now right. that refers to the dinosaurs. In other words, it was older than the age of the dinosaurs. Wow. Okay, so that throws a whole new spin on it. Uh, yes, indeed it does. And some of uh, the uh, scientists who have read the book have obviously recognized that. For example, William Howells, who is one of the uh, big anthropologist of this century, one of the architects of the current paradigm, uh, he said, well, if, if, this, if what you say here is true, it more or less throws a monkey wrench into our whole picture of how uh, life originated on this planet. And I think it does. Something you alluded to a few moments ago I want to bring up again. Uh, you talked about man coexisting with apes and coexisting with another kind of ape-man creature. And you, again, uh, mentioned North America. And I think, of course, there's always been a lot of interest in Bigfoot, which is mm -hmm. essentially where this yes. is coming, coming yeah. from. Um, some of the information that you brought forward is that this is just a descendant of this same wild man creature that was existing years ago. That's, that's a distinct possibility. Now, when I first heard about you know, this subject, I was extremely skeptical. But what, what turned me around is when I began to read reports about these creatures by a very well-respected anthropologist. For example, Grover S. Kratz, who's at the University of Washington, you know, up in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. He has extensively studied the footprints of these creatures, and he says they're biologically convincing. There is no possible way that they could have been hoaxed, and he's pretty well convinced that these creatures do exist. So that's the sort of thing that convinced me that uh, there is a very good chance that they're there, and uh, that from the descriptions of these creatures, they seem to match very well some of the descriptions that we get of the ape-man-like creatures that supposedly existed millions of years ago. Okay. So, but yet there, we keep coming around to the same thing. People just don't want to believe it. They just, like you said, well, they're skeptical. They go, oh, no, that's, that's just a hoax. They're not hearing the information that noted scientists are finding. Well, all we really wanted to do in our book is put the facts on the table, all of them, not, not just the facts that you will see, will see in, in the current textbooks, but all of the facts uh, that are relevant to this whole subject and let people draw their own conclusions. One of the things that, one of the questions I first came up with when I was reading the book that you did answer in the book that I'd like you to explain was that mm -hmm. I said, well, gee, don't we have all these machines now that can look at the footprints or the bones mm -hmm. or whatever, and that will just tell us how old it is? Oh, this is, this is a very common perception. We have such faith in technology and those who employ it uh, that we, when we hear about things like carbon-14 testing or potassium-argon testing. We think it really is a very simple process, almost like you pop something in the microwave and right. boom, it comes out. Uh, it's not like that at all. These are very complicated procedures. Uh, what I found in practice is, is that scientists may run several tests on the same piece of bone. Some of the ages will be very great, some very small. And they will tend to pick the date to publish in their scientific literature that 
most fits the idea that they start out with about how old the fossil should be. Mm -hmm. Now that, that often happens. What, what do scientists and researchers have to gain by distorting their findings? I mean, you would think that if they found, if they truly think that they found evidence of, of man pre-existing the dates that we take for granted right now, um, that they would want to be published, that they would want people to hear about this, that they, they would get their name up in lights, as it were, um, as, as making this remarkable discovery. Why is this so suppressed? Well, there are, are, there are tremendous pressures for uh, conformity uh, within uh, the scientific community. For example, for every academic post that opens up, every professorship that opens up in an American university, there are generally hundreds of applicants. Mm -hmm. And it does not help your reputation if you go reporting things that should not uh, be reported. It could be very bad for one's reputation. And in our book, we, we document several cases of that. Uh, for example, uh, Virginia Steen McIntyre. She's a, a geologist who I personally know. She lives in Colorado now. Uh, she went to Mexico in the 1970s, and she was a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. She dated a site there where some uh, human artifacts have been found at 300,000 years. Mm -hmm. all, all her test results show that that was the age of that site. Uh, but because that went against the dominant idea that uh, human beings have only been in North America for, for 30,000 years, uh, she said she was not able to get the report published. Uh, uh, she was uh, labeled a publicity seeker mm -hmm. and a maverick. In, um, in her community of scholars, and she said she eventually lost a professorship that she held at an American university uh, because of this and hasn't been able to work as a geologist since. Now, this is not the, the normal picture that we have of how science works, but uh, unfortunately, these are the sorts of things that can happen, and these are the sorts of uh, pressures that can be applied uh, in order to keep a certain view intact. Mm -hmm. so, so what do people need to do now? They, they apparently, we need the public to open their minds up a little bit more to alternative ideas to what we've yes. been taught. Well, I think one thing we need to do is uh, develop a little bit more of a healthy skepticism towards pronouncements from spokespersons from the scientific community. Uh, just as we've learned uh, not to accept without question every pronouncement that may come from you know, the press secretary of a politician mm -hmm. or uh, the, the uh, public relations office of a corporation. Uh, we may want to dig a little further, keep an open mind, have some healthy skepticism, and I think uh, perhaps uh, we've placed spokespersons from the scientific community on a little bit of a pedestal, uh, and we may need to give them this, the same uh, sort of uh, uh, treatment that we would give to spokespersons from other, other uh, groups in society. The Bible answers the riddle of our origin in four simple words, and God created man. Darwin looked at monkeys and saw Michelangelo. But for modern anthropologists who try to put a name and a date to the dawn of humankind, the answer is constantly changing. Fossils discovered recently in Ethiopia put our earliest ancestors at around 4.4 million years, but some scientists believe that there is evidence that we are much older than that. On an archaeological dig in Huayatlico, Mexico, Dr. Virginia Steen McIntyre discovered tools that predated the earliest known humans. Her find created a storm of controversy. I don't really want to be in the center of a controversy. I never asked to be in the center of a controversy, but I'm here. And um, doggone it, I, I want to get the information out. I want to get at the truth. I guess that's what it is. Why does Dr. Steen McIntyre feel the need to protect her artifacts from her more mainstream colleagues? Why are contradictory findings being met with contempt instead of excitement? Some researchers charge it's because these new findings would turn modern anthropology on its head.
Welcome back to Talkin' Pittsburgh. Nice to have you with us. And uh, this next segment should prove very interesting to you. How old are we? I mean, as a race. How old are human beings? How long have we been on the face of the earth? Well, science says one thing, and this book, The Hidden History of the Human Race, says a major scientific cover-up is exposed and the claims that scientists are, are uh, sort of hiding things. Michael uh, Cremo is an author and researcher specializing in the history and philosophy of science, and he, uh, along with Richard Thompson, uh, incidentally, Richard Thompson uh, got his Ph.D. in mathematics from Cornell University. Michael Cremo, what is, what is your background? More in uh, journalism? Uh, I'm an investigative writer. Investigative writer. In other right. words, you did most of the writing uh, of the Most book. of the writing and investigating. I, get, I, I have to give you credit for this. Uh, you know, uh, here's one, uh, one testimonial that said, Hidden History is a detective novel as much as a scholarly tour de force. The murderer is not the butler, neither is the victim, a rich old man with many heirs. The victim is man himself, and the role of the assassin is played by numerous scientists. That's in talking about this book. And down here, this is where I give you credit. You put in here, here's another testimonial. Your book is pure humbug and does not deserve to be taken seriously by anyone but a fool. That's an anthropologist who represents the scientific establishment's viewpoint. Where do you differ with the scientific establishment in this book? Well, you're right. This, this book is causing shockwaves in the scientific community. And where we differ is... Let's just put the facts on the table and, and, and look at them and see how they've been dealt with. Uh, now, I can give you another example. Yeah, there is one thing, though. Yeah. Your scientific delvings, if you will, right. have to be tempered, as everyone's is, by their own feelings. Yes. Now, you are a member of the Hare Krishna um, Society, yes. yeah. the Society, International Society for Krishna Consciousness, as is your co-author. That's true. Okay, you could have an ulterior... Well, even if you were trying not to. Right. Now, you, Hare Krishna believes in old souls, right? I mean, th right. that we have been here for forever. Yes. Now, yes, I am a, a member of the Bhaktivedanta Institute, which is right. the science studies branch of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And we do take some inspiration from uh, the Vedic literatures of India, which do contain accounts of human civilizations being present right. on this planet. Uh, millions of years ago. But my point would be, if archaeology is actually a science, then it shouldn't matter, you know, what your motive is. It's like bowling. If you bowl a strike, who cares if you're doing it for uh, this reason or another? I mean, facts are facts. Now, the facts that well, we've uncovered... Well, we know statistics right. uh, uh, can be uh, distorted uh, for whichever oh. way someone wants them to be distorted. We know that. Right. The, you, you and I could take the same statistic and change it around and make it look different. So let's look at them. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and on the other hand, uh, other people, and I think we've documented this in the book, that there is a commitment to this idea that we have uh, a recent origin on this planet that is itself biasing biasing the uh, presentation okay. of Let the me facts. tell folks, if they want to learn more about what you've written about, The Hidden History of the Human Race is the book. And this is Michael uh, Cremo. I thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we have run out of time. Well, and, uh, pleasure that I've been here, Ron. Very nice to have you with us. Uh, check it out if you're interested in the history of man and find out if you're a million years old, two million years old, or just a hundred thousand. Have a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend. Stay tuned now for Della Cruz. She'll be along in just a few moments. I'd like to move along uh, here in uh, some of the additional myths that you have listed here, Michael Cremo. Uh, you have talked in terms of the uh, fact that scientists don't cheat. That's a myth. You say there's actual cheating going on. Oh, that's very well documented. For example, the, the Piltdown case is a very famous case that documents that. Now, what that has to do with is early in this century, uh, there was a purported discovery of an ape man in England uh, based on a skull and a jawbone. And this Piltdown man, Piltdown ape man, was in the science textbooks for about 40 years. And then uh, suddenly it was revealed that the British Museum had tested these fossils and determined that it was a very elaborate hoax. 
and many people have speculated about the identity of the person who was the hoaxer and practically all of them center on different scientists in England such as Sir Grafton Elliot Smith or Sir Arthur Smith Woodward uh, all very well established scientists in England because only somebody who who knew the scientific ver method very well could have prepared these fossils in such a way that they would have fooled the scientific community all around the world for 40 or 50 years. So some scientist who wanted to perhaps give some evidence in favor of evolution, because there's not very much of it, uh, invented this ape man and in a very sophisticated way uh, cheated, literally. And this is admitted by the scientists themselves. And there are more examples I could give, and we document many of them in our book, The Hidden History of the Human Race. Myth number three, um, Michael, that you have written evidence that goes against human elevation or evolution is reported only by crackpots. Now this, this is one of the standard techniques that the scientific community tries to use against anybody that reports something that goes against their ideas. Uh, they try to label them in a derogatory way without actually discussing the facts. And I think we've all had experience of that. Um, but uh, the real facts are is that actual scientists have, over the past 150 years, reported many astounding facts that go against the theory of evolution. And the present scientific community doesn't want people to know that. They want, they want to promote the idea that anybody that's against evolution is somehow or other a, a religious fanatic, a crackpot, uh, but it's simply not true. And I've, I've, had, I've personally met uh, scientists who have uh, discovered some of these things, and what happens to them is it's, it's, uh, it's very unfair, the treatment to which they are subjected. Okay, we're, okay, we're going to go to Anton in Brookfield, Wisconsin. Anton, how are you? Fine, thank you. Your comment. I've often uh, wondered how the perfect complementary uh, male-female systems of reproduction could have evolved from unintelligent life forms. You know, Anton, not only is that a good question, but also the point is if, if evolution occurred, It'd have to be simultaneous evolution of both species at the same time. Right. Because if it took a million years uh, for the female to evolve, uh, it would have kind of messed up the, the whole procreation thing, wouldn't it? Right. That's my question. A good Thanks. question. Uh, stay right there, Michael Cremo, your response. Well, I would like to put together a book called Darwin's Fairy Tales. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that would be one of them. You, you can just look at so many examples of complex structures and behaviors in uh, different creatures, whether it's the, how, how the spider learned to spin its web or how our uh, human uh, reproduction system came about or any of these things. They're a complete mystery. They're not explained even theoretically uh, by the evolutionist. And they're, what they do is, when they want to explain anything, they just wave their magic wand and said, it happened by evolution. And that's why I call it Darwin's Fairy Tales. Well, I think it's time to begin to look at the implications of all of this. I, I can assure our uh, audience that, that you have hundreds of, of similar cases. And... Uh, Obviously, you, you are inspired by uh, a religious tradition, as, as we that's, mentioned that's correct. earlier. You're, you're, a, you're a student of the Hindu Vedantic tradition. Right. Uh, it's very different than, than the Christian Jewish fundamentalist tradition that mm -hmm. insists on a divine creation that occurred some 5,000 years ago. The, the Hindu view of time is, is not linear as, as Western 
as, as we Westerners conceive of time, it doesn't start with a big bang and, and end uh, with a whimper. <laughs> it, it, right. It's cyclical, isn't it? Yes. Uh, the basic pattern is cyclical. And this is, this is actually the subject of a presentation I shall be making in New Delhi uh, to the World Archaeological Congress uh, called Puranic Time in the Archaeological Record. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 the concept of co time that you do find in the Puranas is, in fact, cyclical. Now, what, mu what uh, might one predict from that? Say if you have civilizations coming and going uh, over vast periods of time, uh, perhaps you might have humans and other uh, ape-man-like creatures coexisting. I, I will mention that the Puranas do talk about intelligent races of ape-like creatures uh, that use stone tools. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not an idea that came in with uh, Darwin. It's been there for thousands of years. Now, what might one predict from that? Uh, if you were to predict what archaeologists might find, uh, you would say, well, they would tend to find a very bewildering mixture of anatomically modern human fossils, ape man-like fossils, uh, uh, crude stone tools, uh, articles uh, indicative of a higher level higher level of culture, all sort of mixed up and going back, you know, hundreds of millions of years. Mm -hmm. I think you might also predict that given the uh, biases of investigators towards a linear progressive idea of time with things beginning in a very simple state and progressing in a linear fashion to a more advanced state, uh, that they might edit Mm -hmm. that record mm -hmm. to conform to their linear progressive biases mm -hmm. and indeed uh, both predictions we found in our investigations do come true you actually do have that very bewildering you know mixture of uh, advanced artifacts and bones mixed up with more primitive ones mm -hmm. going back hundreds of millions of years mm -hmm. and you also uh, do find a very systematic editing of this record to conform to a linear, progressive, you might call it evolutionary, view of things, mm -hmm. which is quite amazing. Mm -hmm. Of course, if, if we have this sort of cyclar, cyclical picture, circular yeah. picture of, of things, uh, much of uh, conventional science will need to be readjusted. And, and naturally, I suppose it's only fair to say that uh, Vedantic thought uh, has many other ideas about the nature of time and space, uh, the, the nature of spiritual dimensions. I, I believe that, that your view of things would be that rather than say that uh, humanity evolved from simple uh, celled creatures with, that the, in some sense we rather descended from spiritual planes. Uh, yes, and this is, this is a matter that... Ron in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Ron, how are you? Yeah, good evening. I, uh, I'm just going to make a question here and then hang up and listen. Obviously your two guests do not believe that we evolved from lower primates. And like, uh, interestingly well, enough, one of them comes from a, a Judeo-Christian background and one not. Right. Now my question is, if we did not, then where do you two people feel we did come from? And I'd like some hard evidence of a Garden of Eden. Thank you. Okay. Actually, this is the subject matter of the next book that Richard Thompson and I are working on. We call it Human Devolution uh, because from the evidence that we can see, it appears that if our origin is not on this planet, we did not evolve from apes on this planet. We come from a higher spiritual dimension of reality. Um, there is creation involved. You know, we have a relation with a, a supreme spiritual being, and that is what the actual evidence suggests. Now, to make a, a scientific case for that, uh, we have to, first of all, show that there is more to reality. There is more to the human essence than just atoms, just chemistry. Uh, now, this is a, another whole subject, and it took eight years for us to do the research for the hidden history of the human race. 
And we wanted to do all that research so we could make a convincing case. And we're now in the process of making such a convincing case for uh, human beings as being ultimately spiritual in origin. And we intend to make a very convincing case for that in our next book. All the evidence suggests that human beings, as we know them, did not originate on this planet, but have come to this Earth from other dimensions. This network special will follow the efforts of a new breed of scientists who are courageously revealing a vast body of hidden knowledge. Carved stones, ancient statues, and human artifacts have been ignored by the academic establishment to protect their long-held theories of human origins. But should this evidence be allowed to speak for itself, the history of man on this planet may never be the same again. The complete title is Human Devolution, a Vedic Alternative to Darwin's Theory. In my last book, Forbidden Archaeology, I presented evidence that contradicts the evolutionary theory of human origins. So people asked me if we didn't evolve from the apes, then where did we come from? So I answer that question in this book, Human Devolution. In this book, I say before we ask the question, where did human beings come from, we should first ask the question, what is a human being? We should know what it is we're trying to explain. Today, Many scientists will say that a human being is simply a combination of the ordinary material elements. But if we look at all the evidence that comes to us from science, we will see that it is more reasonable to say that a human being is a combination of three things. Ordinary matter, yes, that's part of what a human being is, but beyond that there is a subtle mind element and beyond that there is an element of pure consciousness or spirit, if you like that word. So a human being is a combination of matter, mind, and consciousness or spirit and there is scientific evidence for this. We don't have to speak about the ordinary matter because everyone already accepts that but what evidence is there for a subtle mind element associated with the human organism that can act on ordinary matter in ways that we can't explain by our current laws of physics. One type of evidence comes from experiments with random number generators. Robert John was head of the engineering department at Princeton University in the United States. He began doing some experiments with these machines. A random number generator is a machine that will generate a random series of zeros and ones 
If you let the machines run by themselves, they will generate 50% zeros, 50% ones. But John recruited students from Princeton University to sit in front of these machines. And they were instructed to simply will mentally that the machines, for example, generate more zeros than ones. The experiments have gone on for over 10 years with thousands of trials, and they have found that the students were actually able to do this. They were actually able to influence the machines to generate more zeros than ones or more ones than zeros simply according to their mental intention. This provides evidence for a subtle mind element associated with the human organism that can act on ordinary matter in ways that we really can't explain by our current laws of physics. Is there any evidence for a conscious self that can exist apart from the body, apart from the mind? There is. It comes from medical reports of out-of-body experiences. There are times when a person should be completely unconscious. Uh, for example, during a heart attack, blood stops flowing to the brain. Medical instrumentation shows that the brain waves cease. During such moments, a person should be completely unconscious. However, some people in this condition report separating from their bodies and observing what the doctors and nurses trying to revive them are doing. And these experiments have been duplicated in many countries. Physicians in many countries have noted this phenomenon and have concluded it is genuine. So if we look at all the evidence, we see that it is more reasonable to say that a human being is a combination of matter, mind, and consciousness than to say that a human being is simply a combination of the ordinary material elements. So then, if we want to speak about human origins, we have to explain where all these things came from and how they came together in the human form. So once we accept that a human being is composed of matter, mind, and consciousness, this leads to the idea that we live in a multi-level cosmos where one level is dominated by ordinary matter and inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. That's where we find ourselves now. Uh, but beyond that, there is a level of the cosmos dominated by the subtle mental energies and inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. Throughout history, people have had different names for such beings. Uh, they have called them angels, gods, goddesses, astral beings. There are many names for them. However, beyond that, there is a level of pure consciousness or spirit inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. One thing we notice about consciousness, it's individual, it's personal. This suggests that the source of all conscious beings is also individual and personal. It is possible to stay on the level of pure consciousness or spirit living in harmony with the source of all conscious beings. However, if a conscious self gives up its connection with the source of all conscious beings, it enters into the lower levels of the cosmos. It enters into the regions of mind and matter and becomes covered by those elements. So that is what I mean by devolution. It's the process whereby a conscious self departs from the level of pure consciousness or spirit and enters into the lower regions of the cosmos. 
becoming covered by the lower elements of mind and matter. So, to put it very simply, we don't evolve up from matter, as many scientists now believe. Rather, we devolve or come down from the level of pure consciousness or spirit. But it is a process that can be reversed. Uh, every great spiritual tradition of the world has some process of meditation, prayer, or yoga, which is meant to help restore the conscious self to its original position, to free it from its coverings of the lower energies. Uh, and that is the actual purpose of human life.